Greetings and salutations, it's me, Colin Moriarty. Today, I'm here to show you a little bit of Dragon Quest XI, which is coming out by the time I publish this, I think next week, and I'm playing it here on PlayStation 4. The copy of the game was provided to me for free, well ahead of time, well ahead of release by Square Enix, so I thank them for that, but I'm also telling you that so that you can take what I say with a grain of salt, if you like, as I did not pay for the game. Now, as a lot of you know, I'm a huge Dragon Quest fan, going way back to the NES when we knew it as Dragon Warrior. I was enamored, I was completely enamored with Dragon Warrior as a kid, and it was long before I even played it, because I was born in 1984. We got Dragon Warrior in the West in 1989, the first one. It was released in Japan in 1986, actually, so... It took us a long time to get it, but I was a huge fan when I was five, six, before I was even playing the games, of all of the inserts that the games came with. They came with these really robust instruction manuals and these huge maps and, like, diagrams of all the enemies and their strengths and weaknesses and the items they drop and everything. I just used to pour over those documents, and it's really Dragon Quest, Dragon Warrior, but, you know, Dragon Quest is what it really is called, that is responsible for me getting into Japanese role-playing games. JRPGs, as many of you know, is one of my favorite genres and has been for most of my life, and... It all starts here, and, and finally, we get the precious 11th Dragon Quest game. We've been waiting a long time for it. So as I explain what the game's all about, or at least kind of show it to you mechanically and stuff, uh, I'm, I'm going to kind of just run around this area, Laguna di Gondolia. What I kind of want to do here, if it's okay with you guys, is show you a little bit of this section, kind of teleport to a new section of the game or a different section to show you a little bit of geodiversity. And then I will come back to Gondolia, which is a town right over there, as you can see here, this tower beyond that lies a town and we'll kind of end there by showing you the town and maybe showing you just a little bit of the story uh as of now as of as of i'm showing you guys this game i'm about 13 or 14 hours into the game i had anticipated being way further into the game at the point in which i'm recording this let's play i had originally wanted to do a video review of the game in fact and i just wasn't able to do it i wasn't in a position to do it i work way too much on my company i just i'm not able to play 100 hour games the way i used to so I have to kind of take my time and do the best I can. So what I ended up doing was reaching out to Square Enix PR and asking them if I could do a Let's Play instead of a review or a, a, a live stream because the review guide that they showed was, in fact, or that they gave us rather, showed only the ability to kind of capture footage for a video review or capture footage for, you know, or as part of a live stream on Twitch or whatever, and I don't want to do that. And obviously I'm not in a position to review the game. So they gave me permission to show you guys a little bit of the game in this format. So I thank them for that because I think it'll be very useful for you guys to see. So, as you can see here, you can use some enemies as mounts. I don't really know the point other than they have some special skills at different points in the game. I won't spoil anything for you that might be useful to you, but I'm just going to dismount. I just wanted to show it to you guys. Um, but let's get into the combat and, sh and, talk and show you a little bit about what Dragon Quest combat's all about here in Dragon Quest XI. Now, it's a traditional turn-based role-playing game, like all the Dragon Quest games, save 10, of course, which was never released here in the West. That's an MMO that was on Wii. And... While it's turn-based, there used to be random battles, but starting, I think, in Dragon Quest IX and here continuing in Dragon Quest XI, you can see the enemies on the map, which is very Tails-like. So you swipe at them or you can run into them. Swiping at them takes some of their energy away as the battle begins, gives you a little bit of an advantage, and then we're given to, you know, right into the menus. On the right side there, you can see my cast of characters. I actually have five characters in my party right now, or in my greater party, but only four are allowed in battle at once. You can see their hit points, their magic points, and, of course, their levels. Tactics are really important here because, as you can see, my main character, who I've named after myself, Colin, follows my orders, but everyone else fights wisely on their own. That's automatically where these characters are set, including Eric, who isn't in my party right now. But if you select on one of them and you scroll all the way to the bottom, you can have them follow your orders, but you can also do other things like focus on healing, mix it up, fight wisely, show no mercy, which is basically all out attacks if you want. And you could change those things in the middle of battle as well. But I think it's totally pragmatic and practical to kind of just remain controlling your main character, let the computer do the rest. Uh, they'll, of course, base their attacks based on the skills that they've learned, the magic that they know by leveling up, and, of course, by the equipment and items and accessories that you've equipped on them and use on them. So, it really is no different than fighting, kind of, you know, it, it would basically be more of this. Just You'd basically be just doing this the entire time pressing X. So, it allows you to kind of play the game out. You can take control at any time. Again, the tactics button there is in the bottom left corner. But we beat the enemies quickly enough. Now, I, again, I'm not crazy about this entire system of running into enemies. I feel like the random battle system that Dragon Quest was so well known for and obviously was emulated by so many other games, so many other Japanese role-playing games, I feel like there was a purpose to that, which was to like force you to level up in an appropriate way. Now that I'm fighting enemies or having to kind of run into enemies to fight them, I feel like I'm fighting too much and I'm over-leveling my enemies. 
or my uh, my my characters rather I should say I'm sorry I'm misspeaking a little bit there but I basically feel like I'm overcompensating and making the game too easy for me I, I've got been nowhere near dying in my 13 or 14 hours with the game so far not necessarily unusual if you play role-playing games competently but nonetheless, you know, I would like a little bit more difficulty. I guess I could gauge that by simply avoiding more general, you know, or more attacks here. But I don't know. It just doesn't feel right. If it were up to me, we would get rid of the, the of this system and do random battles kind of more traditionally. But I understand also that it makes the environments look way more populated by not doing that. If you removed these enemies, it would basically just be empty kind of sections. And even though this game's not open world, the sections, as you can see, are pretty big. So I understand that it kind of, again, looks makes it look populated. So let's run back up here. We were just up here before, but let's see if we can fight just one more enemy, and I'll show you some other things as well. So, similar enemies that we fought before. Again, you can change your characters in the lineup here, so I can, you know, right now, why don't I swap uh, Silvando out for Eric? He's a little bit stronger. By the way, characters that are not in your party still earn experience points. So that's useful. So Eric comes into the battle, and again, it happens very seamlessly. And then we can fight. So my character has a certain amount of skills here. He has some offensive and defensive attacks, magical attacks. And he also has abilities. So like I can use this flame slash. We'll use it on Splatty, whatever the fuck his name is. Punk, Splatty Punk. And take him out. So again, pretty straightforward, traditional Japanese role-playing game. Exactly what you would expect out of Dragon Quest. And of course, as I mentioned earlier, with Dragon Quest X, which I think was released in 2011 or 2012 only in Japan, that being an MMO, we were really waiting a long time for this game because unbelievably, believe it or not, Dragon Quest VIII, which was the last console, you know, exclusive, let's say, traditional Dragon Quest game, came out when I was in college. I think it was in 2005. I think I was like a sophomore or a junior in college. That was a long time ago. And Dragon Quest IX was a 3DS game, or actually an original DS game, I think, a Nintendo DS game. It was before 3DS came out. I think it came out in 2009 in Japan and 2010 in the West. And that was a really great game, but again, we haven't had a console Dragon Quest game in so long, so it's really nice to not only be back in this world, and or in these kinds of worlds, and in this aesthetic, but just kind of looking at the game, it's nothing to write home about from a graphical perspective, I guess. I mean, it's not like the most beautiful thing you've ever seen, but I'm quite enamored with the color palette. I really think that there's a lot of, you know, look how pretty the water is. I mean, the game, the game looks really nice, and I think one of the coolest things about the game that I really enjoy are the enemy models. When you fight the enemies there's just something really quite alive and and uh, quite pleasant, I guess, about the enemy models. Way more than, I think, the character models, whether your own characters, the NPCs you meet, you know, etc., kind of uh, the characters you might meet in towns and whatnot. I really do think that they did a nice job with the enemies, and they're, they're colorful, and, you know, especially with the traditional enemies that we know so well, like the Slimes and the Drakis and, and whatever, the Magicians, those models, it, it, it's just, it's nice to see them finally realized in this kind of game, and obviously, we had Dragon Quest Heroes and Dragon Quest Builders, but those aren't really the same, and, and they're certainly not on this graphical level, especially a Musou, uh, like Heroes, certainly isn't going to have this graphical flair, so again, while not the prettiest game in the world, certainly, certainly a, a really nice looking game nonetheless. So we've seen enough of this Laguna di Gondolia area. I'm going to go ahead and bring up my menu and go to magic. And I'm going to zoom, which is the teleportation uh, spell in the game. And we're going to go to Galopolis, which was the previous part of the game that I was at. Again, I'm not going to spoil anything for you with the story. We'll kind of conclude with that at the end and you guys can cut out. I'll show you a little bit of the story, a little bit of what the cutscenes look like. But in the meantime, let's teleport. So I want to go to south of Galopolis to a campsite. And in the meantime, you can kind of check out the map. This is the world map, not unlike world maps you see in any Japanese role-playing game. There's nothing really special about it, I guess. The one thing that's important to note, though, is that you see that kind of circular thing at the bottom of the screen. That's actually kind of a clock. There is a day-night cycle in Dragon Quest. That's not super important, at least not super important to me right now. Maybe it becomes more important later on in the game. Uh, but nonetheless, the day goes into night and back in the day. It brings out different enemies. You're allowed to do different you know, side quests and things of this nature. Again, I haven't noticed anything too crazy. I try to keep it daytime, just feel safer that way. But maybe my lack of difficulty, the lack of difficulty I was complaining about would be ameliorated if I played at night. So this is a campsite, and I'm a two on top of it with my HUD there on the bottom left, but I'm gonna bring up the map by pressing square. And you can see on the north end above the Sultanate of Galopolis, you'll see another like flaming or like, you know, campsite kind of like fire there. That's an icon that indicates that that's a campsite. And the bell icon below it is basically allows you to ring for a horse, which I'll show you how to do in a minute. But just to show you how the campsite works, because it's kind of interesting, you can approach the campsite, 
at any time, as long as you, you know, you're around one, and sit around it. Your party will kind of spread out. You can circle out by hitting the circle and have a little bit of, you know, you can talk to the characters if you want in your party, but you can also hit up this guy. He's a roving emporium and he'll have, you know, kind of basic weapons, nothing too strong for you to, to kind of check out as well as items, some basic items like medicinal herbs and stuff like that if you want to buy anything from them. But the cool is, well, the coolest thing I should say, at least at this point in the game, about the campsite is this mobile forge. And it's using this forge that you can actually use the materials that you find around the environment. You might get them after battle. You might find them in treasure chests, etc., and so on. You can use them as long as you have the recipes and the knowledge and the know-how to forge weapons, armor, and accessories. So just to give you an example, I'm going to forge an iron broadsword. And again, there's lots of options here. As you can see, you can forge wands. If I go back here, you can forge you know, various accessories that might be useful, like gloves and rings, etc. But again, I'm going to go back to the weapons. I'm going to forge... Uh, an iron broadsword, and I'll show you how it works. So to forge it, by the way, you need iron ore, copper ore. As you can see, I have plenty of both. So we'll throw those into the pot. But it doesn't stop here. Now you kind of have to use your hammer, hammer here to kind of, you know, make your weapon. And the bashes and flourishes that you're given access to interact with what's there on the right side, which are these bars that associate with the kind of the liquid, I guess, that you're forging into something solid and so you can bash them and you want to kind of get into those green meters and that will make your item stronger but the flourishes here allow you to like do more power or less power and kind of refine it in just such a way that you get the, you know you extract the most powerful weapons possible so we'll hit this a couple times and we'll see if we can get right there so that's perfect we want to leave that we'll bash the second one and that's perfect another i mean we're doing great here and then we'll hit this one I think we can do a little bit better, so let's do the lightning bash, which is a half-strength bash, to see if we can get there, and that's perfect! And then we can finish. And we should get a perfect plus three broadsword, I think. Let's check it out. Yeah, there you go, perfection. So it should be an iron broadsword plus three. Now, a not useful to any of my characters. This is this is not strong enough for me to use, but again, I wanted to just give you an example of how items are forged in case you were curious. So we put that in the bag and we can sell it later if we want. By the way, the perfectionist pearls, as you see here, you'll see them in the corner right there on the right side. You can use those to rework an item. If you don't like one of the items you created, you want to make it stronger or try different techniques, you're able to do that with the perfectionist pearl. But otherwise, you know, the statue here, very typical. This is also at the churches in the game. Confession is allowed to save. Divination will show you how much experience you need. Kind of useless. You can resurrect fallen enemies. Or, I'm sorry, fallen characters in your party. You can cure poison. You can remove curses. And this thing here, you can use rect uh, rectification to move skill points around. I'll show you the skill menu in just a moment. But let's sit at the campfire and we'll rest and we'll make it dawn. So we'll bring the daylight back out so you can see this beautiful landscape here outside of uh, the city that the, the Sultanate of Galopolis. So as you can see here, very different area. The area we were in before was watery. It was full of canals and waterways. And here is more of a desert with rocky outcroppings and different enemies. So let's run into some of these enemies. Some familiar enemies, like the Chimera here, that you'll recognize if you are a fan of Dragon Quest. And again, this section was a little bit a while ago, so I'm really destroying these enemies. These enemies are too weak. But again, I wanted to. I don't want to show you anything, you know, too far back that might not be interesting. But I also don't want to move forward with the game too far and kind of spoil anything for you. Although, again, I'll show you just a little bit of the uh, the story at the end if you want to see it, and you're obviously able to X out of the video if you don't. So if I bring up the map here, you can see that everything. It's it's again very tales like, in that it's got the guise of open world and non-linearity, but it's actually pretty linear and actually almost too linear for my taste, at least so far. I'm not super impressed with the openness of the game. Not that Dragon Quest was ever open, but I felt like in the old, you know, pixelated era when we were playing Dragon Quest, I felt like there was just a little more openness and a little more mystery than I guess I'm finding now in the game. Which is a little disappointing, but I mean, nothing, nothing to really be that, you know, to complain too deeply about. Not too many enemies here on this path, although they're cropping up there. There's one there. Let's do one more fight, just to give you a little bit of a different taste. So these robber rabbits should go down pretty quickly. As you can see 
here. I'll use the Sizz spell that will hit them both at the same time with the Fire spell, although my magic is just not very strong, so that's basically going to be supplemental damage. But it looks like Serena's going to use Wush, which is a, a Wind spell, which does more damage. And then again, we have the same exact spell, the Fizz spell, from Veronica that takes the Robber Rabbits out and gets us some precious experience. Now, I shouldn't go any further without showing you guys the menu. And this is a menu, when you press triangle, that comes up. Should be very familiar if you're a Dragon Quest fan, because it's pretty much identical to all the Dragon Quest games. And it's not quite active around you, but it, lo it has the guise of being active. You can see your characters there on the right. On the top right is how much gold I have. I've spent most of it on equipment recently. And then you have these six options here. Items, equipment, attributes, magic, party talk, and miscellaneous. If you go into items... Everyone has their own item set, so you can actually put, you know, as is typical again in Dragon Quest, I can give Colin or Eric or Veronica, for instance, some healing and curative items, and they'll be able to access those in battle. But if you, they don't have them in their inventory, they won't be able to access them because you can't necessarily access your item bag easily in battle. So I'm relying more on spells. But if I go down to the item bag, you'll see plenty of items that should be perfectly familiar to you, including, you know, the ore that we were looking at earlier to make our items with, medicinal herbs, you know, seed of agility which is a permanent increase, and I save all of those seeds for late in the game. I don't use them now. But yeah, I mean, pretty typical stuff here. Equipment bag. All of this equipment, for the most part, on this first page is stuff that I cannot sell. These are basically the starting gear for a lot of my characters, although there's, you know, items and accessories that I can equip on my characters here. And then important items, which we won't go too deep into because I don't want to spoil any part of the game for you. Again, the story, not so robust. I don't know anyone that plays Dragon Quest for the story, but there is a story here, and I don't want to spoil it for you too deeply. If we go into equipment, you'll see something very typical, not only for Dragon Quest, but for JRPGs with, with familiar statistics and statistical values, but also familiar kind of equipment types. You have your sword or your weapon. So Eric and Colin are both, you know, my character, are both using uh, a rapier, which is a single-handed, one-handed sword. And so they're, uh, you know, at least Colin is able to kind of hold a shield, which increases his, his defense and his ability to block. I think I have a 7% chance to block any attack using that equipment. But also, I'm able to equip, obviously, a helmet and armor. And then here's where things get a little more interesting because you're able to ex equip two accessories, and these accessories do different things as well. So, you know, I have different charms and things of this nature. But I'm pretty much in, you know, perfect in terms of equipment right now. I have the most powerful stuff that I can possibly imagine. And earlier, I mentioned that, you know, swords, and not only swords, but staffs and, and rods and everything can be two-handed. Veronica here has a two-handed wizard staff, which is very important for her to use because it allows her to, you know, increase increases her magical attacks and, and the potency of her magic. But I could give her a one, uh, kind of a one-handed weapon that would allow her to attack a little bit more potently, but the magic wouldn't be as good. So there's always these trade-offs that you kind of have to worry about and think about in the game. If you go to attributes, again, you can see all of your your you know your HP, your MP, your attack, your magical might, etc. There on the right side, how much experience you have and how much experience you need to get to the next level, and then the equipment kind of at a glance that you have equipped, and you can go through kind of everyone here and check things out that way. And by the way, there's a cool thing here too where it shows you how many mini medals, which again is a, is a Dragon Quest classic, but also the la the last major locations visited. And this is another cool way, along with party talk, as I'm going to show you here, to kind of in inform you of what's been happening and what has happened last in case you're coming to the game after some time off. Because as we all know, it's hard to jump into games when you've walked away from them for a few days or even a week or two weeks at a time if life catches up, if you go on vacation. And with a game that is so incredibly long, like Dragon Quest XI, it, it, it bears to stand that most people that play it are not going to beat it. And, mo and some people that come back to it are going to be lost. So they do nice things to kind of remind you of what was happening. Not only when you load up a game, it reminds you what happened last. You can talk to your party here to remind you of what is, what's needed next. And you can go into that attribute menu and check out where you've been recently in case you want to kind of go and retrace your steps if you're lost. The magic list here shows you the magic that, not that you know, but the magic that you can use outside of battle. And again, the green icon indicates curative, and the yellow icon indicates kind of like a gray magic or kind of a passive magic that can be used, like evac lets you out of dungeons quickly, zoom we just used to teleport to places we've already been, etc. and so on. And finally, miscellaneous hides some interesting kind of secrets in the game that I think you guys will be, not secrets, but kind of the hidden kind of features, let's say that you guys might be interested in. So you can heal all, everything's good there. But if you go into the character builder, this is kind of a, a part of Dragon Quest that we don't necessarily see in Dragon Quest games. We see in a lot of other modern or somewhat modern Japanese role-playing games, including the Tales series, some Final Fantasy games, etc., which is this grid system. And obviously when Dragon Quest began in the 80s, grid systems weren't a thing yet, but now we're kind of catching up with the times. And so you earn these points 
you know, one, two, three points after a, uh, you level up, and you can use them to, you know, to learn new skills that are catered towards each character. So Serena, for instance, who's a magician, can learn more about wands and spears and harpistry, while if you go to Veronica, who uses more dark magic, she's all about heavy wands, whips, vim, but then Eric, who's kind of about melee, swords, knives, boomerangs, and guile. And I've been dumping the points all into kind of one section, and I'm doing that specifically because... You know, first of all, the game recommends that you do that, but it allows you to kind of focus on making your character more dynamic in one way as opposed to like being kind of a, you know, a renaissance man or a renaissance woman and, and, and learning everything. So if we have some points to use, and I think Serena does, let's go in here. We need 10 points to get this, so we don't have enough for that, but we can just, I can just show you what it's like. So a uh, cattle prod, which is a spear attack, which I wouldn't usually get, but just to show you how it unlocks, I just press X. And we learn the skill, and then it opens up what's next to it. So once I open that up, I can now learn with four points, and I'll do that here. If I have spears when attacking, I'll, I'll get plus 10 to strength and so on and so forth. So this is kind of how you unlock the skills in the game. I'm not crazy about this tree. I don't think it's that robust. I don't think it's that dynamic. I don't find it that engaging. But it's an option. It's not only an option. You really should do it because it makes your characters stronger and the game easier. Again, we showed you the lineup before, and we showed you the tactics before that we can kind of get through the other thing that i want to show you other otherwise is the quest catalog and this is something that i feel dragon quest 11 is lacking this shows you the kind of optional quests that you have you know undertaken and i don't want to get too deep into what these quests are because i don't want to spoil anything for you but i will say that there's just not that many at least you know initially there doesn't seem to be that much of it which you know is kind of juxtaposed to dragon quest 9 which to my recollection had a pretty robust and pretty strong quest system that I feel like numbered into the scores, but I could be wrong. I feel like there was a ton of them, but maybe I'm misremembering that. But nonetheless, I feel like the, the menu is vague. It doesn't really allow you to call up what you were doing previously and all of that. And I just feel like the game feels a little constrained for as wide open as it is. I feel like there's there's a little bit of a constraint with the side quest system and the non-linearity that I, again, would like to see, even though that's not necessarily a hallmark of Dragon Quest, they're doing other things to modernize the series or kind of to bring the series forward a little bit into this generation. Again, keeping in mind that we didn't even get a Dragon Quest game on PlayStation 3. So again, this is the first console Dragon Quest game we've gotten since 2005. That is not a Japanese only MMO that was on Wii. So now that I've showed you a little bit of the game, the combat, the menus, the magic, the quests, you know, all of that kind of stuff. What I'm going to do now is go to kind of wrap things up. I'm going to go to my character here and, and again cast Zoom, and I'm going to bring us back to Gondolia, which is the town near where we started the Let's Play. And I think this will be interesting and fun to do, specifically because um, this town is Italian-themed and kind of Venice-themed. It's got these canals and these gondolas that you can ride around on, and everyone kind of, even in text, has this weird kind of flair, this Italian flair to what they're saying. So I want to show you what a town, like what a usual town is in the game. And how you kind of navigate it, what you might find in it. And then I will end the Let's Play by just advancing the story just a little bit and then I'll cut it off. So you guys can see a little bit of the story, a little bit of the voice acting and what the cutscenes look like. The in-game cutscenes anyway. And then we can go on from there. So we're just loading up the town. And I will give it to them in Dragon Quest XI. A problem in a lot of role-playing games, especially as we transition to these more kind of open-ish games that are not polygonal and, or I'm not sorry, not polygonal, but not pixelated and not, you know, 16-bit or even 32-bit, not hand-drawn, whatever the case might be, is that a lot of these places feel like they're not alive. Like, they feel like they're not lived in, there's no population in these towns, etc. I do think that Dragon Quest XI, um, alongside other games that are doing a better job, have kind of um, rectified that situation. The towns here feel like they're populated with people. There's places to go and reasons to be in them. And I think that that's really cool. So I do got to give it up for them on that uh, account. Now, one important thing to notice when you're in towns and other sections, if you run into a character like I am here and a white bubble comes up, that's all they're going to say to you. So, you know, she's just kind of browsing the wares here at the store and she has nothing else to say to you. But if you walk up to this guy or any other character and you see that blue bubble, you can hit X and you can talk to them. This guy's trying to sell me a cat suit for 10,000 gold coins. I'm obviously not going to buy that. I think I'm good on that, but I appreciate the offer. And of course, if I bring up the map here, you can see that there are shops uh, flanking me on the right there, kind of towards the northeast is an armor shop, kind of towards the, the west, and kind of a little bit south is a weapon shop. Uh, the peace sign looking thing on the left side of the map is the church where you can save. I showed you the statue before. Same options there. 
And on the right side, those two icons that are kind of next to each other that you probably aren't making out very well is a bed and a safe, and that indicates that that's an inn and a bank. You can store your your uh, money there in case you die in battle. It'll save it for you. And on the upper kind of left corner, you'll see an item icon because that's an item shop. So just to give you a little taste, I'm going to... Uh, well, actually, this is not the merchant I want to go to. The weapon merchant is over here. I'm not going to buy anything from him, but you can see how the stores work in the game. So again, you know, nothing here. The broader sword would be stronger for Colin, but it's a two-handed weapon. Again, I'd like to keep a, a shield equipped. That's why I'm not using it. I'm equipped with the uh, with the rapier right now, hence the E98. So that's kind of how that works. And, you know, otherwise the towns are really nice, nice and alive. Another important thing to notice here, if I'm just going to back up here a little bit, you can see the pink dot on the HUD which indicates where Veronica is for my party. But that in that circle, that circular pink, you know, orb indicates anyone that has something important to say to you. So if you bring up the map again, you can see that she even appears there. In different, you know, different places at different times of the game, you'll see these. And in case you're lost or you kind of want to know who you should specifically talk to, because everyone else is kind of optional to just kind of advance the story again. Not a very story-driven game. Dragon Quest is not known for that, but if you want to kind of explore all the story has to offer for you, you want to talk to everyone. But these are the people that you need to talk to to kind of get going. So we talk to her, and then we'll advance forward to kind of wrap things up. I know that I need to go to the north end of Gondolia to continue the story, so we'll see what happens up here. You'll see some of the voice acting and stuff, and then we'll cut it off before we spoil too much for you. So as we get close, this will kick in. And again, I'll cut it off in just a few seconds. I just want to show you guys a little bit of what's going on here. So you can see here that there's a kind of an Italian-European theme to these people. This man is very short and very fat. Not unlike your usual Italian. I can say that I'm Italian, so I'm not offending anyone, I hope. I'm only kidding. Your character, by the way, your protagonist, whatever you want to name him, will not talk. In the game, is a silent, you know, a typical JRPG silent protagonist. Who is this guy, though? I don't know that we should go too much further. I think we'll cut it off here before we spoil too much more. But this is, again, Dragon Quest XI, which is available in early September. And I hope you enjoy it. Again, not for everyone. If you're into JRPGs, if you're into traditional role-playing games, traditional Japanese role-playing games... And of course, if you're into J Dragon Quest Dragon Warrior from way back when, this is a game you're probably going to want to check out. Although, again, a lot of games are coming out. It is a huge time investment, 100 hours or so. Not unusual for, you know, the newer Dragon Quest games really beginning probably with 7. They all became that long. Again, traditional turn-based action, you know, leveling up, some upgrades, buying equipment, you know, forging equipment, etc. Nothing too unusual, but quite engaging nonetheless if you're into it. So... Um, I recommend this game if you're into that, but again, stay far away if you're not into role-playing games. So, I'll wrap it up here before we spoil too much more, but I hope you enjoyed the Let's Play. This, again, is Dragon Quest XI. I, again, am Colin Moriarty. I appreciate your love, kindness, and support, and I'll see you next time here on SideQuest. Take care.